Some crimes are so terrible that they deserve the harshest punishment possible. That means a life sentence in prison. But what happens when these sentences stretch beyond the bounds of a human lifespan? How do serial killers manage to outlive their insane prison sentences? Join us in today's video as we explore the stories of some of the most infamous serial killers who outlived the longest prison sentences. Prepare to be mesmerized as we reveal the shocking truth behind their twisted minds. Number 10. Edmund Kemper Edmund Kemper was an American serial killer who terrorized California in the 1970s. His gruesome crimes and disturbing behavior earned him the notorious nickname the Co-Ed Killer. Kemper's twisted spree of violence claimed the lives of ten individuals, including his own grandparents, six college students, and even his own mother. Born in Burbank, California in 1948, Kemper had a troubled childhood marked by abuse and instability. His mother, who suffered from mental illness, was both physically and emotionally abusive towards him. From an early age, Kemper displayed signs of psychopathy. As a result, he engaged in disturbing behaviors such as torturing and killing animals, playing violently with dolls, and expressing twisted fantasies of harming others. At the young age of 15, Kemper's dark path took a horrifying turn when he murdered his grandparents on their farm. Following his arrest, he was sent to a psychiatric hospital, but against the advice of doctors, Kemper was later released into his mother's care in Santa Cruz, California. He managed to convince psychologists that he was reformed, resulting in the sealing of his juvenile record. However, Kemper's spree of violence was far from over. From May 1972 to February 1973, he embarked on a chilling killing spree, targeting young female students who were hitchhiking. After picking them up, he would take them to remote locations where he would brutally murder them using methods such as stabbing, shooting, or suffocating. Once the victims were deceased, Kemper would take their bodies back to his apartment, where he would engage in unthinkable acts, including necrophilia and cannibalism. He would then dissect their bodies. The climax of Kemper's heinous crimes occurred when he murdered his own mother and her best friend. Following the murders, Kemper called the police and confessed to all his crimes himself, showing no remorse for his actions. He was found sane and guilty at his trial in 1973. And despite his request for the death penalty, which was not available in California at the time, Kemper was sentenced to eight concurrent life sentences. Since then, Kemper has been incarcerated at the California Medical Facility in Vacaville. He has been denied parole multiple times, and he has shown no interest in being released. Till today, Kemper stands as one of the few serial killers who have outlived their prison sentences, serving as a chilling reminder of the depths of human depravity. Number 9. Robert Maudsley Next up on the list is Robert Maudsley, who embarked on a chilling killing spree in the 1970s, taking the lives of four people. One of these killings occurred in a psychiatric hospital, and two others took place in a prison, where Maudsley was serving a life sentence for a murder. Born in Liverpool in 1953, Robert's life took a dark turn when he was taken into a Catholic orphanage as a baby. At the age of eight, his parents came to take him home, but unfortunately, his life only became worse from that point onwards. He was subjected to years of violent abuse, and when he turned 16, Robert ran away from home. In the year 1974, he found himself trapped in a spiral of drug abuse, funding his habit by working as a rent boy. It was during this time that he encountered one of his clients, John Farrell, whom he would go on to murder. Robert showed Farrell pictures of minors he had sexually abused before strangling him to death. The brutality of Farrell's murder was so extreme that the police nicknamed Maudsley Blue due to the discoloration of his face. As a result, Robert was sentenced to life in prison with a recommendation that he should never be released. He was sent to Broadmoor Hospital, which housed some of the country's most dangerous prisoners. However, being in Broadmoor did not stop Maudsley from committing further acts of violence. In 1977, he and a fellow prisoner, David Cheeseman, barricaded themselves in a cell with a convicted child killer named David Francis. They tortured Francis for nine hours, but when the guards finally broke down the door, Francis had been murdered. Maudsley was then transferred to Wakefield Prison in Yorkshire, a maximum security facility. 
Once again, he demonstrated that he couldn't be contained. On July 29, 1978, Robert strangled and stabbed another inmate, Snay Darwood, in his cell, hiding his body under the bed. Maudsley continued to stalk the prison wing, searching for his next victim. He attacked Bill Roberts, who had been jailed for sexually assaulting a young girl. Maudsley stabbed Roberts to death and crushed his skull with a makeshift dagger. When Maudsley was confronted, Roberts was already lifeless. He calmly walked up to a prison guard and delivered a chilling statement. There's going to be two less for dinner tonight. In 1983, Maudsley was deemed too dangerous to remain among the general prison population. As a result, officials constructed a special glass cage cell for him in the bowels of Wakefield Prison. Maudsley himself described the cell similar to being buried alive in a coffin, and he wasn't far off. The cell is slightly larger than normal, with a concrete bed, bulletproof windows, and cardboard furniture. The toilet and sink are fixed to the floor. Maudsley receives his food through a small slot, and if he ever leaves the cell, he must be escorted by at least four guards. In 2000, Maudsley went to court in a bid to be allowed to die. He wrote a letter requesting a simple cyanide capsule, stating that it would easily and swiftly resolve the problem of Robert Maudsley. Meanwhile, his request was denied, and he remains in solitary confinement to this day. Having been imprisoned over 50 years ago, Maudsley holds the title of Britain's longest-serving prisoner. He also recently broke a world record for the longest continuous time spent in solitary confinement. Number 8. Carlos Eduardo Robledo Puch. In 1980, a chilling threat was uttered by a serial killer dubbed the Angel of Death when he was locked up for life in prison. Someday I'm going to get out and kill you all. The man who made that threat was Carlos Eduardo Robledo Puch, Argentina's most prolific serial killer, who killed 11 people in just 11 months. Carlos didn't fit the typical profile of a killer, which made him so difficult to catch. He was young, attractive, intelligent, and from a wealthy family. However, he abandoned his privileged life and embarked on a killing spree, and that earned him the infamous title of Angel of Death. He committed his first murder in May 1971, at the young age of 19. Carlos and his childhood friend, Jorge Antonio Ibanez, broke into a store selling parts for Mercedes-Benz, where they found a couple sleeping with their newborn daughter. Carlos fatally shot the husband and seriously injured and sexually assaulted the wife. Just days later, the pair robbed a nightclub, stealing over 2 million pesos in cash before fleeing. Carlos saw an open door to a small room, where he found two security guards sleeping. He immediately opened fire and ended up killing both of them. Ten days later, they entered a supermarket in Vicente Lopez, where they killed the 61-year-old watchman. Carlos then stole over 5 million pesos and drank a whole bottle of whiskey with Ians at the crime scene to celebrate their success. On June 13, 1971, Carlos and Ibanez kidnapped a woman from a Buenos Aires highway. After driving her to a secluded area, Ibanez assaulted her and ordered her out of the car. Carlos then told her to walk without looking backward and shot her five times, killing her on the spot. Ten days later, Carlos kidnapped and murdered another female using the same method. Unfortunately, on August 5, 1971, Ibanez died in a confusing car accident that occurred while Carlos was driving. Later rumors alleged that Carlos could have killed Ibanez and staged the accident as an alibi for Ibanez's murder. But that didn't stop Carlos's murderous rampage after the death of his accomplice. He already had a second partner in crime, Hector Somoza, another childhood friend. They followed the same method until Carlos made a grave mistake on February 3, 1972. He accidentally shot and killed Somoza during one of their break-ins. Carlos tried to cover up his identity by burning off his partner's face with a blowtorch, but he forgot to check his pockets, which contained his ID card. Three days later, the police captured Carlos, and he was charged. Just after his 20th birthday, he was tried and given life imprisonment after being convicted of 11 murders, 17 robberies, one attempted murder, and several sex crimes, Carlos Robledo Puc is now 72 years old, having spent over 50 years in prison. 
hence making him one of the longest serving prisoners in South America. Over time, he has requested a review of his sentence or to be executed by lethal injection, but both requests have been denied as Argentina doesn't have the death penalty. Number seven, Howard Unruh. On September 6, 1949, Howard Unruh embarked on a deadly killing rampage in Camden, New Jersey. In just 12 minutes, he killed 13 people and injured four others. Had he possessed more bullets? Unruh allegedly claimed that he would have killed a thousand people. Experts believe that Unruh had shown signs of disturbed behavior since his early childhood, which became more apparent when he joined the army after high school. While serving in the military, Unruh kept a diary in which he meticulously documented every German soldier he killed, noting the time, date, circumstances, and even describing the aftermath in gruesome detail. After leaving the army in 1945, Unruh moved in with his mother and developed an obsessive behavior and kept tabs on everyone he felt had wronged him, no matter how minor the offense. The breaking of a garden gate between his yard and his neighbors, the Cohens, pushed Unruh over the edge and led him to carry out his long-held fantasies of revenge. Unruh's killing spree began with John Pilarchik, a local shoemaker, whom he shot and killed instantly. He then proceeded to a nearby barber shop, where he shot a young boy sitting atop an old carousel horse, followed by the barber himself. Unruh then turned his attention to a tavern across the street, where he fired multiple shots before heading to the local drugstore, where his neighbors Maurice and Rose Cohen worked. On his way to the drugstore, Unruh shot a bystander, who accidentally walked into him without hesitation. Inside the drugstore, Rose Cohen, who had been hiding in a closet, was shot multiple times. Morris's mother, Minnie, who had tried to call the police, was also shot. Unruh then shot Maurice as he attempted to escape onto the roof of the building. Unruh's violence extended beyond the drugstore as he shot at passing cars, killing the driver and one of the passengers. He then made his way to a tailor shop, searching for his final two victims. He went ahead to find the tailor's wife at home and shot her. In a tragic turn, he mistakenly shot a boy playing with a toy, thinking it was a shadow. By the end of what became known as the Walk of Death, Unruh had killed 12 people and injured four, with one of the injured later succumbing to their wounds. Later on, Unruh willingly surrendered to the police and confessed to his actions, taking full responsibility for the shootings. However, Unruh never stood trial for the mass shooting, as he was found criminally insane and spent over 60 years in the Trenton Psychiatric Hospital. He remained there until his death in 2009, making him one of the longest serving prisoners in United States history. Number six, Patrick David McKay. During the 1970s, Patrick David McKay was known as one of the infamous serial killers in England. He was responsible for the brutal murders of two widows and a priest. Although he initially confessed to killing eight other people, including a nanny and a minor, but later retracted his statement. Born on September 25, 1952, in an abusive household with an alcoholic father, McKay experienced frequent beatings, which affected his behavior and psychological development. As a result, he struggled academically, engaged in bullying behavior towards his younger peers, and had frequent tantrums. McKay's classmates described him as a little terrorist, and he exhibited cruel tendencies towards animals, often mutilating birds. At a young age, McKay began committing criminal acts, including arson and theft. He even made a failed attempt to kill a boy younger than himself, claiming he would have succeeded if he hadn't been restrained. When McKay turned 15, he was diagnosed with psychopathic tendencies and admitted to a psychiatric hospital. After spending four years there, he was released with a determination that he posed no threat to society. Unfortunately, this assessment would prove to be a grave mistake. In 1972, following McKay's release, the affluent areas of Chelsea and Knightsbridge in London were plagued by a series of petty crimes, such as muggings, robberies, and snatching incidents, specifically targeting elderly women. The unidentified criminal would befriend these ladies, gain entry into their homes, and carry out these crimes. It was later revealed that McKay was responsible for these crimes, 
as they were executed using the same method he often used when murdering his victims. On February 14, 1974, McKay attacked 84-year-old Isabella Griffith in her Chelsea home. He physically assaulted, strangled, and stabbed her, and left her lifeless body behind. Despite the severity of the crime, the police initially failed to identify McKay as the perpetrator, and the string of muggings and petty thefts continued in the area. Thirteen months later, McKay struck again. He entered the home of elderly Adele Price and requested a glass of water. Upon entering inside, he carried out a gruesome killing. As if that wasn't enough, McKay killed a priest named Father Anthony Crean in a frenzied attack, using his fists, a knife, and an axe. The 63-year-old priest's mutilated body was left submerged in a bathtub filled with bloody water. It was not until two days later that McKay was arrested. An investigating police officer recalled an incident involving a young McKay who had befriended a priest only to break into his home and steal a check valued at 30 pounds. Upon his arrest, McKay's fingerprints were matched to the ones found at the murder scenes of Isabella Griffith and Adele Price. He confessed to the three killings but then made the shocking claim that he had killed eight more people, dating back to 1973. However, he later withdrew these additional confessions before going to trial. In 1975, McKay was convicted of three counts of manslaughter and sentenced to life imprisonment with a minimum term of 20 years. He has served 48 years behind bars and has been repeatedly denied parole. In 2017, he was granted permission to transfer to an open prison with day release privileges. At some time last year, he was spotted in public, taking a new identity as David Groves, wearing a beard, glasses, a baseball cap, and track pants provided by the prison officials. He was strolling casually through the city center bus station. It seems that McKay may soon become a free man, much to the concern of those aware of his dark past. Now it's time for our subscribers pick. Juan Corona, a Mexican-American, shocked the world in 1971 when he was convicted of brutally killing 25 farm workers in California. Spending 48 years behind bars, he left us wondering, what drove him to such gruesome acts? Moving to the United States in 1950, Corona seemed like an ordinary family man, working as a labor contractor. However, beneath his facade lurked a dark secret, he was literally suffering from schizophrenia. The horrors unfolded in California's peach orchards, where male farm workers were found murdered and buried. Following clues, the police traced the crimes back to Corona, who was found with incriminating evidence. Corona was arrested, tried, and convicted on 25 counts of first-degree murder. He claimed insanity, pleading not guilty, but the evidence was overwhelming. He was sentenced to life in California State Prison Corcoran, with the possibility of parole after 25 years. As the years passed, dementia took its toll on Corona, affecting his memory and thinking abilities. Finally, he passed away in 2019, leaving behind a legacy as one of the most notorious serial killers who outlived the long sentences. So guys, what do you think about the story of this notorious serial killer? Do share your thoughts in the comments section below as we continue with this video. Number five. Elmer Wayne Henley Jr. The notorious life of Elmer Wayne Henley Jr. started when he crossed paths with Dean Corll, one of America's most notorious serial killers in 1971. Unlike Corll's other victims, Henley was not killed, but instead taken under Corll's wing. Unknown to both of them, this encounter would change their lives and end the lives of many others. Henley had a troubled upbringing, growing up in a home filled with violence and abuse, his alcoholic father tormented him until his mother finally fled with the children when Henley was around 14 years old. The scars of his childhood remained, and he longed for a positive father figure in his life. He thought he had found that figure in Dean Corll, but unfortunately, this association led him down a dark and deadly path. Henley met Corll through another teenage accomplice of the serial killer, but this was no ordinary meeting. Henley was actually being sold to Corll, However, Coral saw something special in Henley and made him an offer. Instead of killing him, Coral would pay Henley $200 for every boy he could bring in, and even more if they were good-looking. Tempted by the money, Henley agreed to help. 
He began luring victims to Coral's apartment, believing that they were being sold to the criminal organization Coral was a part of. However, he later discovered that Coral had sexually assaulted and murdered these victims, and that left Henley horrified. Despite his shock and guilt, Henley did not inform the police or put an end to the crimes. Instead, he continued to assist Coral in luring and murdering several more victims, including some of his own close friends. By July 25, 1973, Henley had played a role in leading over 24 boys to their horrific deaths at the hands of Dean Coral and himself. However, one day, Henley decided to put an end to the killings. On August 8, 1973, he brought his friends Tim Curley and Rhonda Williams to Coral's home for what they thought would be a night of fun. But Coral had other plans for them. Henley witnessed Coral tie up and gag his friends, then drag them into his bedroom to be tortured. At that moment, something in Henley snapped. He confronted Coral, stating that he couldn't let him keep killing his friends and that it had to stop. Henley then shot Coral multiple times and ultimately killed him. After killing Coral, Henley immediately called 911 and confessed to the murder. He was charged with six counts of murder, but the shooting of Coral was ruled as self-defense. That made Henley to be sentenced to six consecutive life sentences of 19 nine years each. In prison, Henley expressed remorse for his actions and claimed to believe that he had been reformed. However, he also acknowledged that he would likely never be released and seemed to have made peace with that. Meanwhile, Henley has been in prison for nearly 50 years and will be eligible for parole in 2025. Number four, Larry and Danny Rains. In the history of crime in the United States, one family stands out as a unique case, the Rains family. This is the twisted tale of two brothers, Larry and Danny Rains, who separately became serial killers in unrelated incidents at different times. Their upbringing, personal struggles, and dark secrets paint a chilling picture of the Rains family's history. Larry Rains and his elder brother Danny Rains were born in Kalamazoo, Michigan, to a strict father. The brothers had a tough childhood, often fighting over small amounts of money. Their family was also plagued by the influence of alcohol. In 1954, their father left the family and that made them face their struggles alone. In 1958, Larry, who was 13 years at that time, met a 23-year-old neighbor named Sue, a mother with three children. Over the next few years, he began to spend much of his free time with her and took part in raising her children, eventually beginning an intimate relationship with her. Subsequently, in 1962, both brothers began dating a girl named Kathy from their high school. The impact of dating two different women took a toll on Larry's academic performance, causing him to drop out of school and turn toward a life of crime. It was in 1964 he committed his first crime, where he posed as a hitchhiker and murdered a schoolteacher named Gary Smock during a car ride. Larry later confessed to this murder and admitted to killing four others during robberies. A psychiatric evaluation declared him insane due to the psychological trauma caused by his father. In October 1964, Larry was found guilty of Gary Smock's murder and received a life sentence without the possibility of parole. In the early 1970s, he changed his name to Monk Steppenwolf, inspired by a novel he read in 1967. Larry, now 78 years old, remains incarcerated at the Lakeland Correctional Facility. He is often described as a cold-blooded and manipulative psychopath, showing no remorse for his crimes. Danny Raines, on the other hand, faced a troubled personal life as well. Following his brother's conviction, Danny Raines began frequently arguing with his wife, as well as demonstrating worsening sexual behavior. Danny's encounters with the law led to his incarceration in 1969 after an unsuccessful attempt to harm Dorothy King. After his parole, Danny formed an unlikely friendship with a troubled teenager named Brent Eugene Coster. Together, they embarked on a dark path, resulting in the rape and murder of two young girls Linda Clark and Claudia Bidstrup, in 1972. To cover their tracks, they set fire to their car and abducted another girl, Pamela Fairnow, whom they also murdered. During Danny's trial, Brent Eugene Coaster played a crucial role as a key witness for the prosecution. 
admitting his involvement in the heinous crimes. On August 9, 1973, Danny Rains was found guilty on two counts of first-degree murder and received a life sentence without the possibility of parole. He spent a daunting 50 years in jail before his passing on January 29, 2022 at the age of 78. Number 3. Brent Eugene Coaster Becoming one of the youngest serial killers in the United States at just 15 years old is no small feat, and Brent Eugene Coaster is one of the few who managed to leave the prison walls behind. Growing up was not an easy task for Brent. His mother battled paranoid schizophrenia, while his father succumbed to the clutches of alcohol abuse. In 1972, at the tender age of 15, Brent made a life-altering decision to run away from his troubled home. Little did he know that fate would lead him to Danny Rains through the unexpected connection with his friend's mother, who happened to be Danny's girlfriend. Danny, spotting potential in the young and impressionable Brent, decided to take him under his wing. Together, they embarked on a horrifying killing spree that tragically claimed the lives of three innocent women. However, justice eventually caught up with them. As part of a plea deal, Brent testified against Danny and was convicted of second-degree murder. On July 21, 1975, he was sentenced to life imprisonment with the slim possibility of parole. Behind bars, Brent immersed himself in various sex offender rehabilitation programs and even managed to earn a law degree. He proved to be an exemplary prisoner, impressing officials even though his parole applications faced numerous rejections. Fast forward to September 2020, a significant turn of events occurred. Finally, after showing profound remorse for his past crimes and considering his youth at the time of the offenses, Brent's application for parole was granted. At the hearing, Brent acknowledged that he deserved a life sentence, but pleaded for a chance to make amends and contribute positively to society outside the prison walls. His release stirred fierce opposition from the victims' families, and that left them feeling disheartened. Despite the skepticism surrounding Brent's release, the prison's legal supervisor and a volunteer stood in his defense. They highlighted his genuine remorse and transformation from a misguided teenager to a mature adult. Following his release in January 2021, after serving 48 long years, Brent was mandated to fulfill stringent requirements, including completing a re-entry unit program, a probation period of about four years, and registration as a sex offender. His journey to rehabilitation and redemption continues, with his full discharge from the sentence slated for January 21, 2025. Number 2. Jesse Pomeroy Jesse Pomeroy holds the infamous title of being the youngest person ever convicted of first-degree murder in the United States. He is regarded as one of the most evil serial killers in history, shocking the nation with his horrific crimes against children in the 1870s. However, his killing spree actually began when he was just 11 years old. After spending 50 years in prison, he eventually died while incarcerated. Born with a white film over his right eye, Jesse Pomeroy possessed a sinister appearance that added to the macabre nature of his crimes. Growing up in Charlestown, Massachusetts, he suffered abuse at the hands of his father, who both beat him and confined him to a closet. It was during this troubled upbringing that Pomeroy became infatuated with violence and torture, giving in to his dark impulses. Between 1871 and 1872, Pomeroy targeted eight young boys, he would lure them to secluded places where he would subject them to brutal beatings, stabbings, and mutilations. The victims were left permanently scarred, both physically and emotionally. Eventually, Pomeroy was caught and sent to a reform school, but shockingly, he was released after only 18 months. Subsequently, he moved to South Boston with his mother and brother where he continued his reign of terror. In March 1874, he murdered 10-year-old Katie Curran, who had innocently visited his mother's dress shop. He slit her throat and concealed her body in the basement. Just a month later, he abducted and brutally killed four-year-old Horace Millen. Pomeroy stabbed the young boy multiple times, nearly crushing his head, before dumping his lifeless body in a pit on the beaches of South Boston. Two brothers, George and James Power, were the mastermind behind the discovery of the lifeless body after they went there in search of clams. But having miscalculated the tide's arrival, they took to wandering the area in search of other treasures. 
What they found instead was a small child left dead inside a ditch. During police questioning, Pomeroy confessed to both murders and even provided the location of Katie Curran's body. He was tried as an adult and convicted of first-degree murder. The initial sentence imposed upon him was death by hanging, but it was later commuted to life imprisonment by the governor. For the remainder of his days, Pomeroy was confined to solitary confinement. Despite his imprisonment, he found solace in reading books, writing his autobiography, and repeatedly appealing for his release. Number 1. Warren Harris In 1977, a wave of terror swept through the streets of New Orleans, emanating from the actions of one teenage American serial killer, Warren Harris. The city was shaken to its core by the gruesome killings that took place in its French Quarter. Harris, also known as the infamous French Quarter Stabber, targeted middle-aged gay men, leaving a trail of brutality and fear in his wake. From February 14 to April 7, 1977, five men fell victim to Harris's ruthless attacks. The chilling incidents unfolded within a 20-block radius near the vibrant locales of strip clubs and jazz bars. The names of those tragically killed, Ernest Pommier, Robert Gary, James McClure, Jack Saville, and Alden Delano, became etched in the memory of the community as symbols of the horror that had descended upon them. The shadow of fear cast by these killings lingered over the city, painting a stark picture of a crime that seemed interconnected and deeply unsettling. The residents of New Orleans grappled with the nightmare that had gripped their streets as the identity of the perpetrator remained shrouded in mystery. The reign of terror came to a sudden halt on April 13, 1977, with Harris's arrest as he attempted to harm another individual during a robbery. The authorities sought answers to the question that haunted them. What could drive a teenager to commit such heinous acts of violence? In chilling confessions to the authorities, Harris revealed his deep-seated aversion towards gay individuals, a sentiment he described as revulsion. This revelation shed light on the dark motives that fueled his brutal spree. As the details of his crimes unraveled during investigations, the community was left to grapple with the stark reality of the hatred that had led to such senseless violence. Harris faced trial in October 1977, a swift conclusion that culminated in a guilty verdict on three counts of murder. The sentencing that followed sealed his fate with three consecutive life sentences, ensuring that he would never walk free again. For over 46 years, Warren Harris has remained incarcerated at the Louisiana State Penitentiary. This is a stark reminder of the chilling chapter in New Orleans' history that he inscribed with his actions. Thank you for watching this video. See you in the next one.